so series 5 of Peep Show now. It's one that often seems to divide opinion, and I think extra-wise it will probably get a few sneers too. I noted in series 4 that the additional material for the DVDs looked like it was moving in a bit of a different direction, in that we were getting a lot less new original material and more reflective looks back at older stuff, or a repurposing of the clips from the episodes from the series at hand, and that's definitely a trend that's continued here. No more wholly original episode S segments like we've had in the past, not even a single full episode commentary track, despite having four in the previous series. It's a shame, really, but I guess I can understand the reasons for not putting in as much effort into the DVDs. Okay, so I've got some good news and some bad news. Oh shit. The good news is that there are deleted scenes included for series 5, and even a commentary track for those deleted scenes. Hooray. The bad news is that there are only two deleted scenes. Yes, really two. Totaling a whopping runtime of... 1 minute and 18 seconds. What? Bye then. Now I'm not complaining about getting more peep show content, because obviously this stuff is fun to see, but really? Two? It's a peculiarly low amount. Kinda makes you wonder why they even bothered including any in the first place. You know, undoubtedly there were more than two scenes that were cut from the sixth episode, so it's weird that they only included two of them. Though remember I said that a deleted scenes commentary track is included as well, so indeed we do get a comically short one that features series producer Phil Clark and producer Izzy Mant. A 78 second long commentary track has to be some sort of record, sure in and out of the sound booth in less than two minutes, and this is like a properly billed extra that's listed in the menu and everything. It's not some random, undocumented second audio track that nobody is going to find. How bizarre. It's sort of hard to be creative in that when you're really hungry. But yes, two deleted scenes. One from episode 2, Spin War, and one from episode 3, Jeremy's Broke. The one from Spin War is an extra moment from the time that Mark and Dobby find Sophie throwing up at the fuck bunker. In the complete episode, we cut straight from Mark helping Sophie out of the bathroom to being outside with Jez, Hans, Ian and Barney. But here a moment is included in which Sophie interacts with Jez while he's stalling the time on stage. Now I want all the ladies in the house on this side of the imaginary line to say, oh yeah! Oh yeah! It is what it is, really. In the commentary for this scene, they state that this moment was Olivia Coleman's idea, and she ad-libbed it because she thought it'd be funny of Sophie to be somewhere in the crowd responding to Jez. And it was a sort of ad-lib moment from Olivia, who plays Sophie. Yes. And yeah, it's all right, but you can kind of tell that this wasn't something that was planned out too much in advance, because it doesn't really make sense time-wise with this part of the episode. Like, if Jess is still on stage and Hans and Barney are still backstage at the moment Sophie and Mark are leaving, how could they all be out there waiting for her? So yeah, I don't think it's really a surprise that this one was cut out, as it's not overly funny and it doesn't really flow with the rest of the structure of the episode. Oh yeah! Oh, yeah. But that scene was only 18-ish seconds of the 78 seconds, the one from Jeremy's Broke is a whole lot more meaty. It's a bit in which Jeremy returns to the sperm clinic for a second time, now even more desperate for money. Oh, this is the life running on empty. This is what Kerouac and Gandhi and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall and all those great guys are on about. Given the clothes he's wearing, I think it's safe to assume that he goes here after not being able to sleep because of Saz and the Australians laughing. I'm here to make another deposit at the sticky bank account. I'm afraid it's no more than one donation per week. Okay, look, let's negotiate. Um, I can knock some out at half price. Call it a tenner a pop. I think this bit is really good. Like, Jess is actually using the term sticky bank account seriously and then tries to haggle over semen prices. Throwing away the chance to create a master race. I hope she realises that. He's got the stubble he has in the second half of Jeremy's Broke too, and I think it does a great job of making Jess look like he's run down. I like that such a small difference in his appearance can make you see him quite a lot differently. Only wish I didn't feel so incredibly hungry. Look, I need to eat. He's so desperately hungry that he then eats half a half-eaten sandwich that one of his feckless cum shedder brethren had left behind. I also like the contrast between here and at the start of the episode. There he was stealing a delicious Cumberland final straw dripping in onion gravy, and now it's a sad looking sandwich off a seat in the wank bank. It's not rubbish, not yet. It's still in the packet. This again is a fun moment, and I think it does a great job of showing Jeremy's desperation. However, does anyone else think that the voiceover is quite unfitting here? Like, what Robert is saying doesn't really fit with Jeremy's actions and body language in my opinion. It's still in the packet. I offend everything you believe in, don't I, woman? Even though he's making faces like he thinks the sandwich is amazing, and it's this big relief for him that he's finally eating, he doesn't mention it once in his thoughts. This moment here especially, I don't think the silence goes well with his body language. 
I think I just find it a bit weird that we have a scene building Jess up to be really hungry and then when he finally gets to eat some food, his thoughts are on something entirely different. In the commentary, they say that they liked this scene but it had to be cut for time reasons and they thought that the idea that Jez was completely desperate for money had already been established anyway. We sort of had to cut it for time and we felt we'd got that that beat anyway in the Understood. other scene. I don't know though. I think with a small rewrite of that final interior monologue from Jez, this could have been a fun moment in the episode. Thanks a bunch, Elgar. Despite saying that the bonus features for this series were pretty lacking in comparison to some of the ones previously, something that actually is included here is one of the most unique features that we've had so far throughout all the series. Agreed. 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 Sophie's Peep Show is a segment that goes back over some of Sophie's scenes from Series 5's final episode, Mark's Women, but gives her the audible internal thoughts rather than being exclusively done by Mark and Jeremy. Just go up to him, act normal, he doesn't suspect a thing about me and Jez. It's quite a big moment, really. Obviously it's just an extra, but it's the first time this rather obvious idea has actually been implemented in the show. Chances are on a one-off, nothing's... <laughs> I believe Sam and Jesse had originally actually toyed with the idea of giving Sophie an internal monologue in the full show, just like how Mark and Jez do. They didn't go through with that idea, which I think definitely was the right decision. Being confined to the minds of these two people and not anyone else in the wider peep show world certainly gives the show its edge in my opinion. Knowing what characters like Sophie are thinking at various points in the show wouldn't feel right. It almost feel like cheating. How's Jez? Oh, fine. Naked Jez on the sofa like a big pluck chicken. Okay, so the first thing to look at here is how was this done exactly? The internal thoughts are obviously structurally integral to the way that Peep Show is both written and recorded. Mark and Jeremy's monologues aren't just played over random footage from the show, rather the gaps for them to happen are specifically allocated and are then overdubbed with the lines later on. Why isn't she texting? Maybe she's dead. So for example, you may need an extra five or so seconds of nothing in a take to give you enough room to insert the voiceover that then eventually leads to a character talking, or something like that. But then how does this work for this specific bonus feature, in which Sophie's voiceover is being inserted into scenes that it wasn't originally structured around? Maybe he's actually moved on. He can't have, can he? Well, there seems to be a few different ways that it was done. The first scene included is the one that starts the episode, in which Mark turns over the flat to a stone Sophie giving him the annulment forms. I'll play the two scenes together so that they're initially synced up, and let's just kind of see what happens. Shit, Mark. Lovely, horrible Mark. Sophie? Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, great. Massive pang of guilt. Maybe it wasn't okay. Uh, I've been waiting and I, I thought... Yeah, it might be a bit confusing like this, but I think it's the best way to show off how this feature was done. The scene has been chopped up and a certain line split up and moved apart from each other to allow for the extra Sophie lines to be inserted. I've been waiting and I wanted to give you the annulment forms. Uh, I've been waiting and I, I thought... You're late. But there's also that line in which Mark says he had two and a half pints of Cronenberg, which was not in the actual episode, but is included here. Yeah, I got promoted, so I had two and a half pints of Cronenberg. There's a similar thing in the next scene included too, when Mark and Sophie are talking at the JLB party. This bonus feature includes a line in which Mark jokes about how easy and casual an annulment can apparently be. So easy, isn't it? Annulment. I feel like Henry VIII and I didn't even need to have a reformation. There's new lines that aren't just voiceovers in the next scene too. And the next one. And the next one. In fact, every single scene that is used in this Sophie's Peep Show segment contains unused lines that didn't make it into the final episode. Here's a compilation of some of them. You must miss me. I bet you miss me a bit. Obviously, I do. Contraceptive, the Johnny, it's... I, I, I oh, <laughs> it's old friend. Yes, still broken. Oh no, Soph. You know, the fact that every scene in Sophie's Peep Show just happens to use scenes which had lines cut makes me think two things. One being, why didn't they include any of these cut line scenes in the deleted scenes part? I know they're called deleted scenes, but in every segment of them so far they've included altered scenes as well. Even if only one or two lines are new, it still would have been better than getting a mere two scenes. But secondly, is it really a coincidence that these Sophie's Peep Show scenes have extra lines in them that weren't originally in the episodes? Yeah. Can you handle this, Mr. Corrigan? The cutting of lines to make time happens throughout all of Peep Show and just TV in general, so it's nothing out of the ordinary. But part of me wants to think that Sophie's Peep Show was actually planned from the start and that the script for Mark's Women was written with the creation of it in mind, so they'd specifically give characters lines that weren't going to be included in the final episode just so they have enough extra footage to use for this one segment. The scene with Mark and Sophie drunkenly talking in Mark's office contains this moment where Mark stumbles a bit, plus it has different takes and lines from both Mark and Sophie at multiple multiple different points. Yeah. <laughs> 
really makes you think that this maybe wasn't something that was just scrambled together out of existing footage. In fact, I actually tried my luck and asked writer Sam Bain what the backstory was for the creation of this feature, seeing as he's actually replied to peep show questions I've sent his way in the past, but he didn't reply, unfortunately. Although, you can't really blame him. Focus on your work, your family, your life, or answer questions about the production timeline of a 13-year-old DVD bonus feature. I don't really want to do that again. No, nor me. But whatever, enough of that stuff. Is there anything of note in Sophie's thoughts? Kinda. Apparently she considers herself to speak French to a conversational level. Maybe that in some way played into the whole Paris debacle from the last series. Also has conversational French. She was also faking being upset when Mark asked her if she'd ever considered an involuntary redundancy, which I guess maybe inferred in the regular scene anyway, but I guess this confirms it, if you consider these extras to be part of the peep show canon, of course. Also, I don't know if it's just a me thing, but Sophie's voiceovers often sound more like Olivia Coleman than Sophie, if that makes sense. Like a lot of the time her lines sound like Olivia Coleman recording an audiobook or something. They're too clean, too sprightly. She sounds too proper and too nice to be the Sophie of this era of Peep Show. I've really got to stop getting stoned so much. Although it is kind of brilliant. Okay, got him where I want him, he's back under the old spell. The narration reminds me of voiceovers in Bridget Jones's diary or a TV advert for a trendy new insurance company. Perhaps this is just how Sophie thinks she sounds. Sophie Chapman, irresistible goddess. Yes, actually, Jeremy is a total slut. Oh. The sperms are no longer under his power. They're not like homing pigeons. You can't recall them, I don't think. Maybe I'm just off base and have heard Mark and Jess's voiceovers so much that anything else just feels wrong at this point, but something just doesn't sit quite right with me about how her lines are delivered. It's the same kind of issue that I had with Jeremy's thoughts while he was eating that sandwich in the deleted scene. There's a bit of a disconnect between the characters' actions and their internal thoughts that makes them not work overly well for me, or at least as well as they do in the actual series. The voiceovers are supposed to be this intimate look into our characters. They allow us to hear things that they may not want to share with anyone else, yet oftentimes in this segment it doesn't feel like there's even even much correlation between Sophie's actions and her internal thoughts. That could be intentional, sure, to show that Sophie's changed or gotten a bit out of hand post-jilting, but I'm not sure I'd agree with that take, at least not wholly. Yeah, I can't say I'm overly fond of this bit, but it is somewhat interesting getting a woman's perspective like this in a show which often intentionally doesn't want to let you know what any of the female characters are thinking. What now? Staple his nuts to the desk and call security. Mark and Jez obviously don't know what any of their love interests are thinking, and so us knowing and them not kind of ruins the intimacy of the show for me. I don't think an internal monologue from any other characters like this would have worked as part of the episodes proper, but as a one-off thing, I think it's alright, if just for the novelty factor alone. Certainly an interesting experiment, and one that I'm glad exists. Maybe this sperm will kind of blend inside me and I'll give birth to an anxious stoner who works really, really hard, but still never achieves anything whatsoever. The behind the scenes feature for series 5 doesn't just include on set footage, but rather takes you through more parts of the creation of the show. Everything from initial writing to rehearsals to weather related issues, live on location at the fictional Christian Life 08 festival. Loads fell down last night, all the fencing fell down. One of my favourite parts of it is that we get a look into a writing room that Sam and Jesse have, which conveniently has a giant whiteboard full of ideas on it, some of which are actually legible. What do we have here? Machu Picchu? That eventually comes up three series later in Series 8's Big Mad Andy, when Mark is putting a dampener on Dobby's runner. Living your life isn't just swimming with dolphins and climbing Machu Picchu though, is it? HD Ready, crossed out, I guess to indicate that it was being used, as that pops up in the final episode of this series, Mark's Women. Yeah, but it's HD Ready! It's HD Ready! Wheat Intolerance? That shows up in Series 6, as Elena has one. She's far too important to be able to tolerate wheat. This one's a bit tricky to read. Think of our ship like work? I can't probably make it out. I take it our ship is relationship, and I'm fairly sure that last word is work anyway, but no idea what's between them. We can see some potential names for the game that Mark, Dobby, and Gerard end up playing, Fantasy War Quest. Don't go over there, it's a trap, those trees are not real trees. Although annoyingly, the first word is cut off, so Fantasy War Quest is up there, as is something Battle Quest and something Heroes. There's lots of other stuff on the board too, but it's not really that easy to read, but if anyone has the eyes of an... Eagle. Eagle. As wet as an eagle. It really is. You might be able to make something out. 
At one point, you see them in the process of going through the script for the episode Burgling, and if you look here, it looks like the document is titled To Burgling. Now that could mean it's a second draft or a second edit of the script or something, or it could mean that Burgling was at one point going to be the second episode of the series instead of the first. Fuck off, I'm looking for Kenny. At one point, we see the cast doing a read-through of the episode Jeremy's Manager, and we hear a conversation between Mark and Jez that's different to the one that eventually made it into the final episode. She's teaching me how to do sex properly for the first time, Jez. It's never happened before and I can't see it happening again. Other than that, there's just lots of other clips of various moments from the filming of the series, which are nice to see. The Peep Show Relationship Tree is a pretty odd extra, perhaps the strangest one we've had so far. It's this animated flowchart kind of thing, narrated by Olivia Coleman, probably at the same time she did that Sophie's Peep Show bit, that shows all of the various sexual or relationship links between characters at this point of the show, so the end of series 5. The Orgazoid also receives a similar service from Superhands. Why didn't you tell me about the wanking off bit? Introduce a character and say that they had sex with someone, show clip that demonstrates this, and then on to the next person. Pretty standard stuff to be honest. I guess it's just another way to make a bonus feature out of existing footage, but hey, it's a fairly unique one as far as these things go, and someone has clearly put some effort in here. Superhands also forces Barney, Sophie's cousin, to suck him off. The final picture is fairly substantial, although it has little to do with the 13 minutes of video before it. Like, none of these connections we see being drawn in the feature mean anything in regards to the final outcome. For example, Tony and Superhands are shown getting a connection, but then they don't have one at all in the final image, even though they obviously should do. Don't know what's going on with that. Also, it's missing quite a few characters for no real reason I can deduce. Like, Barney gets on here because he sucked Superhands off, who had previously sucked Jez off, but then why not include people like Tony, the man? who had sex with Tony, the woman, who has slept with Jez. Nah, who cares? They might shag each other. There's no need to actually say it. If, if you say it, you'll break the spell. Something like this would be kind of cool to see for the show once it's definitely all over. Maybe that's now, who knows? But yeah, the Peep Show relationship tree is a thing that exists. And that concludes our trip around the Peep Show relationship tree. There isn't really that much to say about the DVD for Series 5, however, something to note is that in the previous video in this series, I said that despite Mark and Jez both being in their 30s, they were still being referred to as 20-somethings on the box. Pedantic people rejoice, as now they're accurately described as being in their 30s, as they would have been for a while by this point. You're what, 35? Fuck off! And also in the menu for this series, the episode that we all know as Jeremy's Broke is instead titled Jeremy Broke. Maybe Saz stole the apostrophe S along with Mark's dignity. Yeah, speed dating. I'd be better off speed skating. Series 5 is the last time that Peep Show The Scripts and More will be relevant to this video series, as it was published in October of 2008, after the end of Series 5 but before the start of Series 6. On the one hand, it's quite a shame to be at the end of the book, especially considering it has provided some cool bits and pieces that a lot of people probably don't know about. But on the other hand, yay, no more awkwardly angling a book with one hand while trying to scan it with my phone in the other. We've gone into the crease. I can't make out anything in the crease. There are four main segments in the chapter 5 section of this book, the first of which is this, a letter written by 81867321, though he's known as Jeremy Osborne to everyone else except brutal machines. It's a letter that Jez has written to his bank as a response to them telling him his account is overdrawn. It's a pretty funny read, full of the kind of shit you could definitely imagine him saying to Mark. Thought you might like to take five from running sweatshops, turfing widows out of their favelas, and feeding babies poison formula milk full of conflict diamonds to have a read of this. That's a funny sentence, and it kind of reminds me of a line that Jeremy actually has in Series 5, one from when he's talking to Mark in the episode Jeremy's Manager. I don't come around to your work and tell you how to run your sweatshops in Burma. You know, the thing with these kind of segments in the book is that they're a whole lot better read on paper than being delivered with my boring voice, so I don't really want to just read out this whole thing, but I especially like the final paragraph, so here it is on the screen now. Thanks, dickheads. Oh, and by the way, all of these marks or stains or whatever else is on the page are actually printed on the paper. They've used this messy paper template for some of Jez's writings in the previous segments of this book, and I've always been conscious that some people might think that I am just the messiest reader in the world or something, like I'm staining this book. Everything you see is printed on the paper, and this is indeed Jeremy's weird tea stain. Tea bags are allowed within limits. Next up is a biggie. Four whole pages of back and forth emails between Mark, m.corrigan at jlbcredit.co.uk and Sophie, s.chapman at jlbcredit.co.uk. These are from around the time that Sophie is returning to work, so around the time of the episode Spin War. And yeah, that certainly adds up once you see the actual content. You know how in the episode Sophie's acting kinda 
like this. I'm having a laugh, <laughs> so I don't really give a toss. No, of course I fucking don't. Imagine that, but in work email form, and you have this segment of the book. Fuck off. Fuck off, you jilting fuck. Dear fuckface, why don't you shove the meeting up your hairy ass? sit on it, fuckhead. Hey, maybe that's where Mark got that from. You're a fuckhead! It's basically a back and forth of Mark writing a long, overly Markish email, trying to be formal and trying to get things back straightened up at work, while Sophie replies with some variation of fuck. However, of course, given this much text at hand, there's a few bits and pieces to pick out and gnaw on. Sophie returning to work after three weeks rather than the previously agreed six is mentioned, just like in Spin War, and Mark is still not happy about it. Mark references Sex and the City, something he knows that Sophie likes, as it was her password way back in Series 2's dance class. Mark then says he watched Sex and the City on a pirated DVD with super hands, which is a bit odd, but he describes Hans as Jeremy's bandmate, which is obviously true, but Sophie would almost certainly know who Hans was at this point, even if they're not friends. He was even at their engagement together. Mark and Sophie apparently had a honeymoon booked, although it was never mentioned in the show. Three weeks in Mauritius, wow. And he says that he took Jeremy there. Add that to the peep show lore. What? No. No, no, no. Mark leaves a PS saying thanks for the tuna, or heartbreak tuna as he'd call it in front of Jez, though he specifically mentions her father Ian as the one who bought it around. He was there at the door, sure, but it was Barney who really gave it over. No love for the bee man, it seems. Mark explains the circumstances around the wedding day. He aims to dispel a rumour that is apparently going around that he pissed on Sophie's aunt's head, when in reality it was Jeremy, and he only pissed on her hat, which has a wide brim, not her head. So I guess this woman here is confirmed as Sophie's aunt? Maybe? Mark makes up a bunch of lies about the wedding day to try and make himself look better, which obviously have no basis in reality. Such as... <clears throat> He says Jeremy was drunk and high and started raving about God and Christianity, and then started singing atheist hymns in praise of Richard Dawkins, thus Mark took him upstairs to hide him. Mark says that Jeremy became depressed and said he was going to kill himself as well as the soon to be married couple, so Mark wrote a note on a piece of paper to warn Sophie, folded it into a paper aeroplane and threw it, but he missed her and didn't get her attention at all. Brilliant. He then persuaded Jez not to kill himself, and then he protested for Jeremy not to piss himself, but he pissed himself. Himself, all over Sophie's aunt's hat, not head. Mark then sends an email out saying that the meeting he had been trying to involve Sophie in had been cancelled and his desk vandalised. Of course. This bit is long as you can probably tell, but it's funny and backs up what he said in the episode Spin War, where Mark was receiving some shitty emails. It's just mates and that. Fuck off and shut up and die. Next is a note from the big man Alan Johnson to Mark on the topic of the upcoming JLB Christmas party. This again is something that's better read than heard, so feel free to pause. There's a few standout bits here. Use of office equipment for sex-related tomfoolery is to be actively encouraged. Skunky Pete, mentioned a few times and seen in Jeremy's Broke, apparently works in the JLB post room. Who knew? Johnson also says go big on the nibbles, buy Pringles. Maybe Jez can help out with that. I've got coupons for the Pringles. Also, just something to note here. I was googling the fake dodgy beer name that Johnson gives in this email, Kral Zondenberg, and I found that this specific note from Johnson was actually published online by The Guardian in Christmas of 2007 as part of an advert for Channel 4 airing Peep Show on Christmas Day. It's strange. This was before the book was published, or seemingly even advertised. It makes you wonder what else, if anything, from this book was actually released beforehand. It may not all be original material as we originally thought. Anyway, lastly from the book, we have a piece relating to everybody's favourite peep show cult, the New Wellness Centre. It's a transcript of a conversation between Jared, Jeremy, and a man named Edwin, who is actually the guy that Jez was originally interviewed by, played by Alex Lowe. This next section is going to answer a lot of those questions. Turns out that Jez's new name, Jared, was actually not something that he came up with himself. Jared was merely a name that was picked from a list of pre-selected names. This bit of the book is a bit drier than some of the others, to be honest. Most of it is just pretty predictable, making fun of cult stuff. Nobody knows anything in the world except the great leader, Solomon Hunt and his followers, blah blah. Though is that S-O-L-O-M-O-N, as printed in this book, or S-O-L-O-M-A-N, as shown on the Seven Sacred Truths book in the actual episode? Hmm, maybe both versions were on the same name list. You've been going around thinking thoughts your whole life, and look what that's got you. The same thing happens with the centre's website too. In an establishing shot on the actual episode, it can be seen on the front of the building as www.thenewwellnesscentre.org, whilst in the book, it's newwellness.co.uk. Maybe they just have multiple domains. How have your friends and family responded to your spiritual journey? It can be quite challenging for some people. Yeah, challenging. That's a good word. 
challenging. He means challenging. But yeah, here's the entire text. It's not that long. But as I said before, I think these bits are much better read than narrated by me. So if you want the option, there you go. And that's that. Series 5 of Peep Show comes to a close. Albeit quite a bit later than I would have originally liked. Because sometimes it's really hard actually to do your own ideas. 